right, so for this roundtable discussion, question number one is as follows. We often read, oh, sorry, we often refer to man as having been created in the image of God. We're pretty sure that God isn't an older gentleman with a white beard who lives in the clouds. But without the time-worn artistic image, what exactly do we mean by the image of God? I believe that you could conduct a very interesting class on how to conceive image and how the humans are made in that image. It's true, maybe this deserves the whole class, but I'm gonna give you the short version of this answer. So it's true, the image of God that we carry does not reflect the image of some old uh, person with you know, a carrot in one hand and candies in the other, whatever that artistic, or as she beautifully called it, this time-worn artistic image may look like. God is abstract, God has no image. In fact, one of the 13 principles of faith is that we must believe that God is beyond any type of image. God cannot be fathomed in humanistic terms. God is abstract, he is esoteric, he encompasses everything, he's everywhere, but he certainly is not limited to any type of physical structure. When we say, or when God says in the Torah that we are created in the image of God, the Talmud says that this does not really refer to some type of image, but it rather refers to God's characteristics. God is compassionate, so too we have some compassion in us. God is merciful, so too we have some mercy in us. God is good, therefore we too have some goodness in us. God is the creator, therefore we have creating capabilities in us. So it's not referring to an image, but it's really referring to the attributes. The Catholics took it a step further, and they said that the image of God really refers to even a physical image of the human being that reflects a general image of God. How does our physical image reflect that general image of God? Because God too has a right side and a left side, not that he has a game, a physical right side and a physical left side. But the right side means the side of kindness. I'm sure you've seen this Kabbalist, these Kabbalistic chart. We have three intellectual attributes, and then you have seven emotional attributes. Some belong to the right, some belong to the left. The ones on the right are usually attributes of kindness and of giving. The ones to the left are usually attributes of discipline, justice, severity. And then God also has a middle side, which is usually the attribute of consistency, of resilience, of perseverance. So from that standpoint, God also has a metaphoric right side, and left side. So the physical body also reflects God's image in that sense. Now, this image of God also has practical implications in Jewish law. So the Torah has a verse in which that says that an animal should be sentenced to death if an animal attacked and uh, did some damage to a human being. Why? Because a human being carries the image of God. So the image of God was destroyed by an animal or was harmed or blemished by an animal. Now, uh, the other halakhic application is what Rabbi Akiva states in Ethics of Our Fathers, that Chaviv Adam Shnivra B'Tselem, to quote him word for word, which means that every human being is favored because we were created in the image of God. We favored over animals, we favored over plants because we were created in the image of God. But what this means, again, the practical application according to Rabbi Akiva is that therefore every human being deserves to be respected, whether you agree with him or don't agree with him, whether he uh, looks, he or she looks this way or that way. Every human being deserves to be respected because we have the image of God and God needs to be respected. Without the respect of God, we would be living in a jungle. So to every human being ought to be respected because again, we carry the image of God. So we have actual halakhic implication, this idea of carrying the image of God. We can go on and on and on, but I won't get to the many other questions here. So that answers this question. Obviously, if there's any questions about what I said, please. Yes, Julie, go ahead. Well, you know, it's interesting because it reminds me of the portion that we read just two weeks ago, in which we speak about the generation before the flood. God decided to send a flood upon the planet. It is because that generation was completely, utterly fundamentally corrupt. One of the ways of corruption was expressed in a verse that says, that the sons of God picked and took the daughters of man 
because they looked good. In other words, they had all these sexual intercourse, rape and incest, everything, just because they wanted to. But if you look carefully at the words of the verse, it says the sons of God took the daughters of men. And the commentaries explain that that's because these people saw themselves as the sons of God. They are part of the upper echelon of society. These women were the daughters of men. They're subclass. We're VIPs. They're not. Therefore, we can do whatever we want with them. I think the minute we stop looking at others as children of God, that's when chaos ensues. And that's when horrible, horrific activities uh, take place. And I think that, indeed, that um, I don't know what to do with, with human beings like that. I think they need to be educated. Those who, who refuse to be educated need to be uh, limited or, 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 you know, we hope that they, they, they have uh, some, some, uh, some epiphany one day. But, but you're right. Some don't respect others. And we, we, every human being needs to be respected because we're the image of God. Yes. Rabbi, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm sorry. If we are made in the image of God, um, you only described positive attributes, but we are imperfect. We make mistakes and we err. We there's also an evil side in us. So absolutely, is, that is perfect. So how do you explain that? Some people choose to ignore that side of themselves. The idea of us being in the image of God first and foremost must speak to us because we must reflect the image of God and we must be in tune completely with the image of God and we must be a godly and act godly in a godly way. Fortunately, not everyone, we have other sides too. We have an animal soul, for example, like the Tanya said, we have an animalistic side. So some are more in tune with that, unfortunately. But yes, yes, please, Linda. Well, I see that when you meet someone who's never had a time respecting you, you don't need to respect the person, you need to respect the human being. Right. So you can sort of separate that and say, everybody is a child of God. Right. You may not like them, that's okay. Right. But it doesn't mean you don't respect their connection to the universe. Fantastic. Fantastic. Very well said. We don't have to respect the facets that they have, but we do have to respect the face, the image of God that they do have, uh, the essence of themselves. Yes, that's right. Okay, let's go to, yes, yes. You know, you see open names, you see murderers, shooters, child abusers. What are those people? But they are in That's what we were speaking about, yeah. No. Yeah, some people so ignore their own image of God. Not only do they ignore the image of God, but they so, so um, they act in such evil ways that evil becomes a part of themselves. That's what I'm saying. That some people, there's, there's, and we're talking about just a fraction of society, let's be clear, right? But but these people, I, I don't know if there's much hope for them left in this life, right? Right, exactly. Exactly. So the maybe, maybe the only thing, the only way we can interact with them is to learn what not to do. No, or, or learn from them. Learn from them. Learn from their image of God that has been so concealed and so crushed. Is to learn from them what not to do. But other than that... Or pity their inability to act. That's right. You know, I mean, unfortunately, most of these people are in, in trouble if they need to end. You know, they're mentally ill. Most of them are. Yeah. And, and that, it's not possible. Yeah. Mentally ill, I don't mean seriously right. insane. I just mean that something is the button that we put. Yeah. And so yeah, for all sorts of reasons. You're right. No, I, I I would want us, I would want us to focus on ourselves before we focus on those. I think what we can do is change ourselves. You know, like uh, Gandhi famously said, be the change that you want to see in the world. But yes. The people, the people there, the Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next question here. Uh, this is the topic of forgiveness, which is a topic also that appears uh, thereafter. Um, so I'm just going to roll it all up in, in, in these next questions. Um, number one, regarding forgiveness, 
How do you forgive when someone that hurts you is not sorry? Hmm. So we have to remember the fundamental idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not just for the other. Forgiveness is primarily for you so that you can get rid of any toxicity from the inside. Grudges are toxic. Resentment is toxic. When you forgive, it almost has nothing to do with the person that you forgive. It has everything to do with you cleansing yourself. With you. So forgiveness, when someone that you hurt is not sorry, should still take place. So what if he's not sorry? I'm not forgiving only for you. I'm forgiving for me. To cleanse myself of any grudges. The hate, you know, as they say, hatred hurts the hater the most. You are being hurt by not forgiving. So forgive for you, even if he's not sorry. That's secondary. Yes, Janice. Is, is, is forgiving, accepting what they did is okay? No, 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 no. Um, no, that's... Yeah, that's... No, I, if, you, if, I, if you forgive someone, you're saying, it's okay what you did. No, no. When you forgive... No, when you forgive someone, it's not saying it's okay what you did. When you forgive someone is that I was hurt, but I am I found the courage within me to overcome that hurt. Even though what you did was wrong. And I hope that you don't interpret my forgiveness as a sign that you can continue your harmful behavior. Because what you did did hurt me. What you did was wrong. But I found the courage within me to overcome that hurt. So that I can move on with life. So that I, I, I don't have to be stuck in the past and live with this toxicity that we're speaking about. Yes, Geraldine. Yeah. Yeah. So, right, right. So, so, so multiple things. If, if really the hurt is so strong and that the, 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 it just takes over you, which can happen when it's fresh, hopefully with time, it can go away. But then don't think of that person. If you think of that person, think of something else. And I think that's true for anything that causes us negativity. The best way to deal with negative emotions is not to deal with them. Don't deal with them. The best way to deal with negative people is don't deal with them. That's number one. Hopefully with time, we'll, we'll upgrade ourselves to a higher level in which we can look at the good in the person. We can look at the root of the harm that the person caused. Some people, you know, cause harm, harm. but I would say some people, it's, it's almost not their fault. It's almost not their fault. You know, if someone called me an idiot, and that's the way he grew up, to call everyone that bothers him an idiot, am I gonna blame him? Because that's not, got nothing to do with me. So, so I'm hurt by an idiot. All right, fine. But let's look at the bigger picture. The guy that I grew up with this. And there's a thousand, I'm just using the simple example, but there's a thousand more examples like that. Sometimes we have to look at the root, and sometimes we have to look at the good in the person. And again, if there's no good in the person, then we can look at what not to do, not what yes to do. But if still that person brings us so much hurt, then let's not think about them at all. Yeah. Now that's that's topic one. So when someone that hurts you is not sorry, you still have to forgive to get rid of your toxicity. Number two, when deep pain prevents you from forgiving. So you're so hurt by that person that you simply can't forgive them. So, again, you're forgiving not just for that person to, for that person, you forgive for yourself. So, I think part of the way to get rid of your pain is to forgive. Because what causes pain is that toxicity. If the pain is too deep, profound, too, too invasive, then don't think about it. Now, uh, the next question here is deeply connected to this. That's why I'm jumping to this because it's going to relate to, to when deep pain prevents you from forgiving. But the next thing is give us steps to truly forgive. I think one step, again, is mentioned you can look at the entirety of the person. See the good in them and see the root cause. Another step is a more spiritual step. And that is that we believe in Judaism that whatever happens to us, happens to us for a reason. It doesn't happen to us, it happens for us. It happens for a reason. Now, sometimes we can understand this reason. Sometimes it's way beyond our comprehension. It's impossible to understand this reason. But we have to accept the fact that everything is Hashem sent, good and bad. In fact, in Judaism, in Judaism, you have a blessing 
for bad that happens, but unbelievably, it is the exact same blessing as the blessing for when good happens. Almost to say that there is some good in the bad. So all I can see is bad, then I have to open my eyes a little more to try and find the blessing. And sometimes I'll find it immediately. Sometimes it will take a few months or a few years. But we have to believe that everything that happens to us happens for us. Sometimes I know it's very hard to believe that, but that's the general view. In a way, that helps forgiveness too. Maybe it must have happened. I can tell that people have hurt me in life and hurt me. But I look back, I could say, I could, I could look and see, wow, okay, these were turning points in my life that Baruch Hashem produced blessings. So sometimes you can't tell it immediately. Maybe you can tell it over a few years. But we have to believe that it's good. There's a great story about one of the great Hasidic Jews, Rabbi Hillel of Parish, who, uh, who the story is that his entire home was burned down by a fire. So his friends came to comfort him. And they found him saying a blessing of thank you, God, for not making me an idol worshiper. Asked him, what type of blessing is that? Say on a fire that burned down your home. He said, look, if I was an idol worshiper, my idols would have been in the home. My God would have been burnt with the home. My God is not an idol. My God is with me at all times. And therefore, even if a fire is burning my home, it doesn't burn my God. My God still remains strong. And I know that God does things for a good reason. And I'll find that good reason one day. But it doesn't just disappear in fires. It doesn't just, you know, not uh, kamikaze. But that's that's the idea. That's a number. That's number two. Number three, and that takes this idea further. Another step to forgive is to ask ourselves, um, what is a purpose to find in all of this harm? And the biblical example I use is Joseph. Joseph had probably more reasons than all of us put together to be upset at people. Joseph was sold by his brothers. He was first, they, they first attempted to kill him, right? Remember that? They threw him in a pit full of snakes and scorpions. So they attempted murder. Then they sold him to slavery. Then they, because they sold him to slavery, he was, uh, became a slave in someone's house who accused him of rape. He was then put in prison for over 10 years. Then, in prison, he was tortured. Some say that he just say he was great and, and many terrible. So he could be upset at his brothers from here to tomorrow more than we can ever be upset at any people who have heard us. But when his brothers eventually came to Egypt and he's not a vice king and he revealed himself to his brothers, what did he say to them? Don't worry, I'm not upset at you. Don't be afraid. I'll be proud in the words of the Torah. Why? Because you think you sold me here? I wasn't sold. I was sent here to provide for you. If I hadn't been sold, then I wouldn't have been able to be uh, uh, anointed as the vice king of Egypt, and then I wouldn't be able to provide for you. So I wasn't sold here, I was sent. In every harm, in every negative experience that we have, in every harm that we experience, we can view this harm as, as in the eyes of the victim, we're victim, we're sold, things happen to us. Or we can say to ourselves, no, we're not victims, we're victors. We're not sold, we're sent. God put us in a situation so that we can use it to better society, to grow ourselves, and at the same time, make grow society through this experience. And that's a third deeper way of dealing with harm. Saying to ourselves, okay, I experienced this. Let me see how I can transform this as, as a purpose, as a mission. Let me see how I can take myself out of the victim shoes and put myself inside the victor's shoe and transform this experience in a way uh, to serve God on this planet, just like Joseph did. And that, that yet is another profound way to deal with forgiveness. But I think sometimes it's really vital. To truly, to truly be able to forgive, we have to be able to say, I'm not a victim anymore. I was sent to this. Let me just figure out the reason. And in a way, I think that uh, eradicates um, all together. So that's regarding forgiveness. I'm happy to take any comments before we move to the next. Rabbi, uh, do yes. you, I'm sure this reminds me the famous quote by Buddha that says that holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. 
Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think um, it's important yeah. on yourself, not the other person. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. Any other comments? Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay. Next question: Why is there a seven-day mourning period and eleven months? That's right. So that's a good question. In Judaism, God forbid, if a person loses, uh, loses a parent or a sibling in thirty days, not eleven months. But if a person loses a parent, then one has to for Sitcheva, mourn for seven days. And the, the restrictions are quite severe. One should stay home, preferably stay home, not go to work, should sit on a low stool. There's all sorts of mourning customs. That's for seven days. And then for 11 months, one has to say Kaddish, which is really the prayer that we say uh, to memorialize. The person that just passed on. Now, uh, why is there a seven day morning period in 11 months? That's really based on the deep Kabbalistic idea that for seven days, the soul is not completely at rest. Why? Because we are a composition of a body and soul, every single one of us. They, are, My body and my soul work together. Now, hopefully, the soul is always in the driving seat. And it tells the body, hey, give charity. So use your hand. The soul can't give charity by itself. It needs the body for that. So hopefully the body throughout our lives become, becomes a, cha a channel for the soul, for what the soul wants to do. We have to take care of our body so that it's a healthy channel for the soul. We have to take care of our soul and listen to it so that we know really how best to fulfill our mission in this world. But because the body and the soul work together throughout our lifetimes, when the body is no longer here, when the body rots in its grave and the soul is separated from it, the soul, in a way, loses a sense, its sense of identification. Who am I? Until now, I was both a body and a soul. I was married with this body. Now I'm all of a sudden disconnected from this body, so I'm not sure who I am. And it takes time for the soul to transition to an entirely soulful identity. Or the awareness of an entire soulful identity and a soulful world altogether. So what happens during the first seven days? The soul comes back to this world, back and forth, back and forth. Am I this body? No, it's lifeless. Am I, am I part of this world? No, actually, I'm part of another world right now. But for seven days, have a vestige. The soul doesn't exactly know what to do. It goes back and forth. After seven days, it it is elevated to a point of awareness of realization. That it's not in the body anymore. It's not married to this body. And therefore, we sit shiva for seven days, but we are tr we truly believe that for seven days the soul continues aggressively to visit us. It comes to our home, it comes to its body, it comes to this world. Who am I? Am I still connected to these people? Am I still connected to this world? Am I still eating? Am I still playing soccer? Am I still part of this body? Doesn't know. But after seven days, then it's upgraded to the next level. So that's why we sit shiva for seven days. The 11 months, because again, as the Kabbalists teach, this is the maximum time a person, God forbid, can dwell in hell. What is hell? It's a different question, but for 11 months, the most evil stay in hell for 11 months. After 11 months, they upgraded to paradise. I mean, the most, most, most evil stay in hell forever, but people have to go to hell, stay in there for 11 months. So, say Kaddish for 11 months, ready to, in a way, comfort them and help them grow to the next level. That's why we say Kaddish for 11 months. That's what the Kabbalists teach. Yes, I know you had questions. So, so, okay, what is hell? I said it's a different question. Hell is not a place where they burn you with fire and they smack you or whatever it is that other, other people say. Hell in Judaism, um, on one foot, is ready watching a movie of our lives. Now we watch it from a divine perspective because we're in heaven, so we're watching it from a heavenly perspective. And we know exactly what the difference is between good and bad. And when we watch a movie of our lives and we are doing bad, it pains the soul, it embarrasses the soul tremendously. Because again, it's viewing the movie of its life from a holy and heavenly perspective. So it says that it's gosh, I should have known better. That pain, that embarrassment is hell. Okay, and it's all abstract, just like just like the embarrassment in this world is also quite abstract. And pain in this world is also quite abstract. You could have physical 
uh, uh, expressions, but it's very, very soulful. So too, the soul there experiences at the same time from apparent embarrassment and shame and pain. Now, the more person than evil in this world, the longer that state of hell, the longest is 11 months. That's, that's why there's an 11 month period. Yes. So a friend of mine who's conservative and doesn't subscribe, he said that she had to go to say cottage for her husband for a year because it brought to elevate his soul to heaven. Right. So is that part of So that's a good question. So uh, as we said, most evil people, most evil people, and there aren't too many, thank God. Stay there for a maximum of 11 months. So if my father was righteous, my father is still alive. But after 120, he goes, he dies. And then he goes to heaven. I know he's righteous. So I really have to say Kaddish for 11 months. He went straight to heaven. So in that case, we say Kaddish not because a person might be in hell. But we say Kaddish ready to bring uh, pleasure uh, to the soul. Because saying Kaddish, what's Kaddish? Kaddish is really, by the way, the, the prayer for Kaddish doesn't even mention the, the, the word death, doesn't even include this notion of death. The prayer of Kaddish is where we are saying to the soul, we are responding to your death with life. We are choosing the path of construction in face of destruction. And Kaddish is in Gadal with Kaddash Merabah, is our response to the soul saying, don't worry, you don't just disappear from this planet. We are going to take all of your good attributes, all of the kindness that you did, and we are going to multiply it. That statement brings tremendous pleasure to the soul. And therefore, even if someone is righteous, we still say Kaddish for 11 months. Yes, Julie. You're in the community. You're in the community. That's right. And I think that's one of the brilliance of Judaism. The emphasis on community is is can be overemphasized in Judaism, particularly during moments of, of pain. And uh, when a person has to say Kaddish, he has to say it with a minion. The reason is again because of that, like you just said, the support of the community, which comes to bring a, a very strong layer of comfort. Yes, yeah, so it's now yeah, this is personal. Mm -hmm. but now my husband is actually I don't have anything to say for her. So what happens? So it's a good question. First of all, you both can live until 120, and you have nothing to worry about. And by the way, let me tell you a little secret. Hashem is coming soon, and we'll live forever. But, <laughs> but, but, but I, I understand. It's a good point, because the Jewish law also relates to that. The person passes on, and uh, they, there's no one to say Kaddish for that person. It's the community's obligation to say Kaddish for that person. We have someone here, uh, truly a righteous man. I don't know if you know him, Yossi Basha, but mm -hmm. he says Kaddish on behalf of a lot of people every single day. But you're right, it's the obligation of the community. Yeah. Okay, next question. What is the difference between God and Orthodox? Um, first of all, I think you know me by now, I despise label. I don't believe that there's such a thing as an orthodox. It's just a made-up word. And Chabad is a different story. Chabad really is an acronym. I don't know if many of you know this. Chabad is an acronym, a Hebrew acronym, Chet Bet Daleh, which stands for the intellectual attributes of God that we were speaking about before. And that is wisdom, knowledge, uh, understanding, and knowledge. The difference between the three is wisdom is that spark of wisdom that one may have. Think of it as a startup idea. Oh, something came to your mind. Now, it's not enough to just have the idea. You need to develop it. You need to make a business plan. That's intelligence. Wisdom, intelligence. Chokma, Bina. And the third word, the third letter stands for is start, which means knowledge. And that's the implementation of the business plan. So they are known as a Hasidic branch. But Hasidim are known as a Hasidic branch that emphasizes the intellectual attributes of man. And more importantly, how they ought to do everything in their power to understand God and connect to God, not just emotionally, but also intellectually. Most of their discourses are tremendously intellectual. 
And that's because, again, that's what Chabad means, but that's what it relates to. It doesn't relate to how long the coat is, doesn't relate to how long the beard is, doesn't relate to how they, uh, you know, define themselves as Orthodox, conservatives, or Reformed, this relates to their philosophy. So that's what Chabad is. Uh, I understand the, the name the question. I mean, I'm not, not going to run away from it. What's different between Chabad and Orthodox? I would say that if we had to use these labels, we wish, which we should not, but Chabad is no doubt within the Orthodox circle, which maybe relates to the fact that they adhere to Jewish law, to Halakha. To the code of Jewish, of the code of the Jewish of Jewish law, which is also known as the Shulchan Aruch. But other than that, Chabad is really um, a philosophy, not a not a not a, a group of people. Um, okay, uh, forgiveness. Judaism. I think we related to, to this. I know it was talked about a few years ago, but it seems always interesting and questioned by the group. Okay, last question. How do you explain the disconnect, the disconnect of many Jews? Hmm. So I'm going to first say that I don't believe that Jews are um, So the mere term of disconnect should not relate to Jews. It's almost a, a, an oxymoron. Uh, there was a, there's a great Jewish philanthropist that I know well from New York, George Rohr, who once came to the Lubavitch River years ago. I think it was in 1990 or 1991. And he came to boast that he had just organized a whole service for the young professionals of New York in his own synagogue during the high holidays. And he tells the rabbi, I want you to know these people, these young professionals who came, are completely disconnected from Judaism. And I organized the service for them during the high holidays. The rabbi says, what? Say that again? He says, I organized the service for the disconnected Jews, young professionals of New York City in my synagogue. I says, what? And he repeated himself. And since he didn't get the message from the Rebbe, the Rebbe wasn't hard of hearing, he, the Rebbe then explained himself. And he said, please go tell every single one of these Jews that they are not disconnected, that they are connected intrinsically with Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah and Rachel, and as I am and as every other Jew is. So there's no such thing as disconnected. Sometimes the connection is concealed. So maybe that's what the question was about. How do you explain the concealment of Jews, of the, sorry, the connection that Jews have instead of the revelation of that connection? So I'm going to relate to that. I, I think there are many, many factors that contribute to the concealment of this connection. That's how I call it. Uh, one factor is sim simply ignorance. And I don't blame these Jews. They don't grow up in families like that. We, we, are, we are living in a, in a society that is quite ignorant to previous societies. And unfortunately, ignorance permeates every, every subject, including Judaism. They're ignorant. Maimonides calls them Tinokotcha Nishbu, which means babies that were captured. One, ignorance. Number two, I also think that some Jews, and this speaking to of a fraction of, of, of the Jewish nation, some Jews still suffer from a trauma that exile created. What's the trauma? That for 2,000 years they tried to kill us. And for 2,000 years we had to almost like play defense and act uh, afraid. Oh, no, 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 gosh, who knows? Next tomorrow, some Cossack will come into our home and kill us all. Or the day after tomorrow, some Nazi will come and kidnap us. So, so for now, because of that trauma, they're a little bit afraid of being Jewish. It's just a PTSD, just a Jewish PTSD. They're afraid because who knows? Oh, oh so maybe I should hide my Judaism. But no, I'm just like you. I think that, that plays uh, a factor. I will encourage you to conclude and there's a whole book that speaks about this, and it's called We Jews, Who We Are and What Should We Do by none other than Rabbi Dean Steinsaltz. <laughs> so you can look it up. All right.